just a little while. Earlier when we were talking about the end of World War I, the Great War that was supposed to end all wars, but we know how that went with human sinfulness. But nonetheless, uh, when the armistice took place there in November of 1918, shortly thereafter, a number of organizations were formed to help the many veterans that were coming back from that war with the incredible needs that they had. Uh, the British Legion was formed, and then in 1919, the American Legion was formed. And of course, uh, the American Legion next year will sell, celebrate its 100th anniversary. And so the very, very important movements that took place as a result of the devastation of World War I. The poppies also, as a result of that war, became a symbol of remembering veterans and remembering those who gave their lives for their nations. I want you to give your attention to the screen where we're going to show you a video that gives you some of the background of the poem In Flanders Fields. How many of you, show of hands, are familiar with that poem, In Flanders Fields? It's a poem that used to be taught in every English literature class. Many young people, especially in the middle of the 20th century, had to have that poem memorized. It's only three stanzas long, but we've forgotten it. And if there's a poem that we should not forget in Western society, it is in Flanders Fields. One of the things that the video does not mention is the name Flanders Fields. That was a name for a region in Belgium and France where all of the fighting was taking place. Obviously, there were battles outside of French Flanders, but that was a very intense uh, area geographically for the fighting of World War I, hence the name in Flanders Fields. And so give your attention to the screen one more time. Early in the First World War, soldiers were quick to notice that blankets of red poppies were the first signs of life to appear on the devastated battlefields of the Western Front. Burying a close friend and comrade who had been killed on May 2nd, 1915, a Canadian doctor, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, noticed how the bright flowers were pushing through the newly dug graves. Perched in the back of the field ambulance, he contemplated the scene and, in a creative outburst of just 20 minutes, penned one of the most famous poems of all time. In Flanders' fields the poppies blow, between the crosses row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, McCray didn't like his poem at first. He crumpled the paper it was written on and threw it away. But his fellow soldiers admired it and encouraged him to submit it for publication. Having been rejected by the Spectator magazine, it was first published in Punch magazine on December 8, 1915. The poem inspired the use of silk poppies as a symbol of remembrance, championed by two women, an American academic, Moina Michael, and Anna Guerin of France. They encouraged the newly formed British Legion to buy nine million silk poppies for what would become the first poppy appeal in 1921. This raised today's equivalent of £30 million towards the welfare of veterans and the care of their families. 100 years later, the Poppy Appeal still raises funds for this purpose. The Poppy remains a symbol of remembrance and hope, and in Flanders Fields is one of the best loved and well-known poems in the English language. McRae himself died of pneumonia towards the end of the war. His body remains in France, but his poem lives on. And so from now on, when you see those silk poppies around Veterans Day, there's the origin of it. And you can imagine, uh, they raised the equivalent of, you know, 30 million pounds is like 40 million dollars. And they raised that just in that next year after the war in order to try to relieve some of the suffering of the veterans. I want you to listen to L uh, Lieutenant Colonel McRae's poem. Again, he wrote this in 1915. And then sadly, as the video mentioned, he died of pneumonia toward the end of the war but he was a Canadian officer and physician, and so he was seeing uh, the most difficult part of the war as well as he was dealing day after day after day with all of the wounded that were coming in. And again, as the video said, it was after the death of one of his close friends on the battlefield that the next day he sat and he penned this, and here are the words. In Flanders fields the poppies blow, between the crosses row on row, that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard among the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, 
To you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. You can see how those that were sitting around him while he penned this were so moved, but he, as again the video indicated, not content with it, just crumpled up the paper and tossed it aside, but a fellow soldier picked it up and said, no, no, we need to do something with this, and something they did. There are really three things about this poem each of the stanzas portrays for us. The first is that creation can be oblivious uh, to our most violent and foolish acts as human beings, and oblivious in a good sense, as if, as if creation itself, something that God gave us as a gift, reminds us through its silent transcendence that it doesn't matter how powerful you think you may be, human beings. It doesn't matter how much destruction you wreak across a field or a city. It doesn't matter. We stand here stalwart as a reminder. There are forces much greater than you in this world and in this universe. The, the stanza, that first stanza, also reminds us that we can be oblivious to creation's majesty. I mean, here in Flanders fields, as the poppies blow in the wind, and yet in the midst of them, here are all these crosses, row upon row upon row upon row. I mean, the beauty of creation and new life, the very first signs of life coming up in this devastated landscape is the, are the red poppies, and yet in the midst of all of these signs of death, and then in the sky, the larks are bravely singing and flying by, and yet their songs cannot be heard because of the guns below. The second stanza speaks to how temporary our lives are. We are the dead. And he numbers himself among those who, as he was watching hundreds of men fall on a daily basis at times, no doubt every week, we are the dead, yet short days ago we lived. We felt dawn, we saw the sunset, we loved, and we were loved. And then the last stanza talks about a stewardship that we have, a torch that is to be passed on from one generation to the next, because God, in this fallen world, he has ordered that we're only here for so long. This generation, and some of you have heard me say this before, how many times does a generation of people have to cycle through Elizabeth Baptist Church to where there's not one representative of that generation here with us until we finally have, God has our attention and we have that understanding in our minds that indeed our days are numbered. And the scripture tells us, Lord, teach us to number our days. Why? That we might gain a heart of wisdom. That when we sit there and we take an inventory of, you know, what have I done with the time God has given me thus far? Okay, inventory that. What am I going to do with whatever time I have left? And I don't know if that's going to be a year. Is that going to be five years, ten years, fifty years? What's that going to look like? We have no idea. But all we can do is use today that God gives us. And yet, as one generation begins to fail... Their hands can no longer hold the torch. Their, their knees no longer allow them to stand and raise it high. They must throw it to the next generation. And the question is, what will that generation do with the stewardship, the responsibility of carrying on the most important and noble traditions of our society? It is this third stanza, this third emphasis of the stewardship that I want to emphasize in our time together this morning. The title, Soldier of Soldiers, for our sermon, it should be an echo of something that you have heard before in the scriptures. In the Old Testament, there's a term that is, or a title that's used to refer to uh, and, and to honor rulers, very impressive rulers. Uh, and then in the New Testament, we see that same title used, but in a redundant way, uh, with respect to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So with that, Soldier of Soldiers brings to your mind, for many of you, the title what? King of Kings. Right. King of Kings is used in the Old Testament in the book of Ezra and in the book of Daniel. The first time that it's used in Ezra, it's, it's referring to King Artaxerxes. The second time it's used in Ezra, it's referring to Nebuchadnezzar. And then likewise in Daniel, it refers to Nebuchadnezzar as well. In the New Testament, we see that title used of our Lord... And that title was a, a common title in the ancient Near East for powerful rulers. 
But when it's used with our Lord in the New Testament, and there's only three places where we see it, in the book of Timothy, and then also in Revelation. And when you look at those uses, the redundancy is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Just kind of emphasizing that there is no sovereign greater than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 13, where the apostle writes, I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Jesus Christ, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that is, he stood strong before Pontius Pilate, that you would keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the only blessed and potentate, and that potentate is again the term for a ruler, king of kings and lord of lords. So Paul uses that when he writes Timothy, and he says, indeed, the one that we serve is the sovereign of all sovereigns. In Revelation, we see this title used in chapter 17 and in chapter 19. So Timothy and Revelation are the three places where we see King of Kings and Lord of Lords in reference to our Savior. In Revelation chapter 17 and in chapter 19, both contexts are contexts of war. In Revelation 17, sometime toward the latter portion of humanity's existence here on this earth, God is going to allow ten kings to rise up. They will form an alliance with a prophet known as the beast that stands against our God and all things biblical. And they will give their power and allegiance to the beast. And they will make war with our Lord, but they will not prevail. Revelation 17, 12 says this, The ten horns which you see are ten kings who have received no kingdom as of yet, but they will receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. And these are of one mind, and they will give their power and their authority to the beast, and they will make war with the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them, for He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. I know, that's, a, that's an amen and a hallelujah for sure. Revelation 19 has our Lord coming back, and this is what John sees when the Lord comes back. Revelation 19, 13, he was clothed in a robe dipped in blood. I mean, like a warrior on a battlefield. His garments are, are, are smattered with blood, but it, it's his own because he is the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. His name is called the Word of God, and the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, follow him on white horses. Any of you ever want a white horse? I mean, come on, show of hands. I mean, when I was a kid, I, I, wanted, I never got a horse, but I always wanted a horse, and I wanted a white horse. And if, if you ever wanted a white horse, you're going to get one as long as you stay close to the Lord and you've given your life to Him. You'll get a white horse. Now, that's not why you give your life to the Lord, but that's an attaboy in the process. But nonetheless, they're on white horses, and out of His mouth goes a sharp sword that with it He will strike the nations and He will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself will tread the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. What Revelation 19, 15 is saying with the sword that proceeds from his mouth is really the antithesis of Genesis 1. God speaks creation into existence in Genesis 1. God speaks portions of creation into annihilation in Revelation 19. The only weapon he has to use is his voice. Because whatever he commands, it shall be. And you want to oppose him with just a word, he'll absolutely destroy you. And then we read this. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I don't know what you think about tattoos. But all I've got to say is this. A man with quads that are so big, he has tattooed on them, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you don't want to mess with him. All right? Somebody who walks into a room and, and that's what they've got, I mean, all right, I'm giving up. I'm, I'm not going to tangle with you. you. You're pretty tough. I mean, our Lord, when he comes back, he is not going to come as he came the first time. The first time, he's a peasant from Galilee. The first time, he's the Lamb of God that would be sacrificed for the sin of the world. The second time he comes back, he's a warrior. He is not only king of kings. He is not only lord of lords. He is the soldier of soldiers, and he's ready to fight. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and no one will stand before his wrath. 
That is the God that we're dealing with. It's interesting, the motto for U.S. Special Forces, uh, Special Forces is the term designated for Army Green Berets, it differentiated from Special Operations, which is an umbrella term used to refer to elite units from all the different branches of our armed services. But the, the Special Forces, the Green Beret motto, is to liberate the oppressed. Has anybody liberated the oppressed as much as Jesus of Nazareth? Matter of fact, the, the book of Isaiah says specifically the mission of the Messiah is to free the oppressed. Has anyone, as we admire soldiers for being willing to give their lives that others might live, has anyone sacrificed for so many as the Christ? We saw in the video at the beginning of our service, soldiers, no doubt, will dig foxholes in order to fight. <clears throat> has any besides Jesus the Christ, dug all the way to hell itself in order to destroy sin and death in his fight for what is right? And then what about his resistance while he was here with us on this earth? The scripture tells us he was in all ways tempted as you're tempted and as I'm tempted, yet he was without sin. Has anyone resisted sin and fought the spiritual powers of wickedness to the, to the degree that Jesus of Nazareth did? No. Matter of fact, C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, he says this, No one knows how bad he is until he's tried very hard to be good. It is a silly idea that good people do not know what temptation really means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. And then speaking out of his World War II context, his life context, C.S. Lewis writes, After all, you find out the strength of the German army by fighting it, not by giving in. You find out the strength of the wind by walking against it, not by lying down. You see, a man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply doesn't know what it, what it would have been like to fight for an hour later. That's why bad people, in a sense, know very little about badness. They've lived a sheltered life by always giving in. We never find out the strength of an evil impulse inside of us until we really decide to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only one who never yielded to temptation, he is also the only one who knows to the full what temptation means. He is the only complete realist when it comes to the power of evil. All of us, I mean, the, the enemy will throw his, his attack on us. He'll throw the temptations toward us, and, and we, we run up the white flag. I can't do this. I'm going to have to give in to it. But Jesus Christ, and I want you to hear this, tempted in every way as we are as human beings, yet he never gave in. You want to talk about a fighter. Courage, strength, a soldier of soldiers. And, and what about the martyrs? the martyrs that have gone before us that have lived in the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, you can hear them speak to us uh, through the words of Lieutenant Colonel McRae when he says, Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. And we can only fight for so long. And then we have to turn the fight over to someone else. And whether they'll fight to win or whether they'll throw up the white flag, we have no idea. We can only control our time and what, we're, what we are given the responsibility of doing. But at some point, we must throw the torch to another. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. It's why the apostle tells his young pupil, Timothy, who was a pastor in the early church, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he might please him who enlists him as a soldier. There is a torch that has been passed to you and to me from faithful generations of Christians that have gone before us. And will we fight like they fought? Will we hold high the banner of Christ like they did? Will we give our all to the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Or will we half-step it when we're marching along? It's interesting when it talks about not being 
involved and entangled in the affairs of this life that one might be solely devoted to him who enlisted him as a soldier. Uh, that's one of the things that people admired about former General, now Secretary of Defense Mattis, Mad Dog Mattis. One of the terms they used about him was that he was a military monk. And that's a term that was used quite frequently in the military, particularly in the Army and in the Marine Corps. And a military monk was an individual who was so focused to his or her, well, his military service in Mattis' case, that so focused you give up what? You give up what? And what do monks give up? I mean, what are monks known for giving up? Family, relationship, right. You give up a companion, you give up a spouse, you give up a family because you're that focused. And that's what Mattis did. His whole life has been focused on the Marine Corps. The Apostle Paul says the same thing elsewhere in service to our Lord and Savior, where he says, you know what, if, if God has put it upon your heart that you need a companion and you want to marry, by all means marry. He says, it's a wonderful thing, it's a gift from God, and, and we need that, we need that companionship. But then he goes on, he says this, but if, if at all possible, it's better for you to remain as I am. And what did he mean by that? He's singly devoted to Jesus Christ. It's, if you're really going to take the gospel and you're going to just let God have his way with you, it's going to be easier for you to do it if you don't have the concerns of, of a spouse or children or grandchildren. I mean, that's, that's how, how committed Paul was to the furtherance of the gospel. They say to Paul, well, we're going to throw you in jail. I don't care. I don't care. I've been there before. I'm not worried about. I'm not worried about making a living. I don't have anybody that I have to provide for. I'm here to serve Jesus Christ, and that's the only thing I'm doing. We're going to take away your house. I don't have a house. We're going to take away the land that you should have built a house on. I don't have any land. I mean, what are you going to do? You know, we'll kill you. Well, my life is not my own. So to live is Christ, to die is gain. Matter of fact, I'm torn between the two. I don't know which one I want to do. This guy's crazy. I mean, that's what they thought. He's so devoted to Jesus Christ. Well, and that's, that's what he gets at here when he tells Timothy. Timothy, you know, if you marry, that's fine. You know, if, if, and you tell your parishioners and your other church leaders, if they marry, that's fine. But, but you do have to be focused on the most important thing. And the most important thing is serving God. And, and how do we do this? How is it that we serve God faithfully here in this fallen world? Let me read to you uh, what George Ladd says in his book on the, the gospel of the kingdom. And he writes this. The kingdom of God is here. And remember, Jesus said that in his ministry. The kingdom of God is here, present with you. The kingdom of God is here. But instead of destroying human sovereignty, that is, human leadership and political systems, instead of destroying human sovereignty, it has attacked the sovereignty of Satan. The kingdom of God is here, but instead of making changes in the external political order of things, it is making changes in the spiritual order, in the lives of men and women. And he goes on, and he says this, the old age is going on, that is, this fallen world, the sinfulness of the, this world, the political systems of this world. The old age is going on, yet men may already enjoy the power of the age to come. The kingdom of Satan still stands, but the kingdom of God has invaded the kingdom of Satan. Men and women may now be delivered from this power, delivered from this bondage, delivered from the mastery of sin and death. This deliverance is accomplished because the power of the future kingdom of glory has already come among men in secret, quiet forms to work in their very midst. Do you believe that? Do you believe that that's what God is doing with you and with me? Now let me ask you this question. Okay, you've got... Kingdom A, and then you've got Kingdom B, all right? If Kingdom A is going to attack Kingdom B, what's Kingdom A going to do before they attack Kingdom B? What, what's that? Assess the enemy. Okay, they're going to they're gonna assess the enemy. What are some of the ways they're going to assess the enemy? Spies, right. So Kingdom A is going to start putting all around Kingdom B... Little spies. Let me ask you this. Do the spies have the power to overthrow Kingdom B? No, not at all. Absolutely not. Which is why in some ways the spies, they're acting covertly. I mean, they're not out in the open. It's kind of a, a behind, behind the scenes. But the spies have the courage to go to Kingdom B, and the spies have the courage to fight for Kingdom A because they know what's coming. 
What's that? The rest of them. The rest are coming. There will be an invasion. Okay, let me ask you this now. The, the Battle of the Bulge, when we saw the video at the very beginning of the gentleman who uh, received his, his uh, uh, knapsack uh, after having been in the Battle of the Bulge. Before we could ever get so far into Europe to get to Germany to fight the Battle of the Bulge, what, hap what had to happen first? Right, Normandy. June 6, 1944. What was that? That was D-Day. Okay, but before D-Day, what happened on June 5th? Before all of those Allied ships came ashore in Normandy, what happened the day before, the night before? Paratroopers went in. The 101st Airborne Division went in. The 82nd Airborne Division went in. They had, a, they had one sole purpose, absolutely disrupt everything that's happening in the enemy territory. Uh, blow up rail cars. I mean, just fight whoever you come up against. Just disrupt what's going on in preparation for the invasion that's coming. Now, did the 82nd Airborne Division and the 101st Airborne Division have the power to establish a foothold in Europe if that invasion had never come the next day? Not at all. But guess what? Even before the 82nd Airborne Division and the 101st went in, guess who went in? Those spies, and, and in World War II, we formed some units in the army that were called Pathfinders. Pathfinders went in in such small units just to assess the situation on the ground in order to be able to signal back to command, particularly to the Air Force pilots that would be coming in at night, to signal where the paratroopers should be dropped. In some cases, where the ships should best come in. A lot of what Pathfinders did then, and, and this, this torch, I have a pin on, it's a torch with wings. And this is the Pathfinder badge for the U.S. Army. But a lot of what Pathfinders used to do can be done with satellite, but still there's no replacing having someone's eyes right there on the ground assessing the situation. But in order to have the confidence to be a Pathfinder, in order to have the confidence to be a paratrooper, in order to have a confidence to be a spy, you've got to believe 100% in the cause, and you've got to believe what somebody over here said. You've got to believe the rest of the group is coming. There will be an invasion. I don't have the power to do this myself. I'm just playing my small part. But I do believe and I have the confidence this is worth giving my life for and there's, there's coming an invasion. Do you realize that every time you make the decision to be a better Christian, which means a better husband, a better father, a better mother, a better wife, a better son, a better daughter, better aunt, better uncle, better grandparent, you know, whatever case, you, you just go right down the list. A better employee, a better employer. Every time you make the decision to be a stronger Christian and to live out the principles of Christ and not the selfishness that's in my heart and your heart, every time you do that, it is like you are a pathfinder on the ground and you are bringing a little bit more of the kingdom of our God, the kingdom of heaven, into this fallen world. And you're pushing back the enemy. Every time you stand for Christ in your home, and you say, Pastor, you don't know how dysfunctional my home can get at times. It doesn't matter how dysfunctional it is. Every time you stand for Christ in the midst of the dysfunction, let me tell you what you're doing. You're disrupting the dysfunction. You, you, are, an, an, you are a special operator for the kingdom of God in this fallen world. Don't give up. Have confidence in the bigger picture of what God wants to do in and through you. I can remember when I was in the military, there was a story that floated around. We were like, are you kidding me? And uh, there was a Navy SEAL. They were doing a training operation in which they were doing an insertion, a maritime insertion. And so the SEALs would go out the torpedo chutes of the subs, and then they would make their way. Well, one of the SEALs got disconnected from the rest of the team, and um, they couldn't find him. Well, then they found him like, I mean, it was more than 24 hours had gone by, and he had been looking at the stars and look in the waves. This was in the Mediterranean. And, uh, and he was just kind of kicking along, just paddling there, going toward land. And so another naval vessel picked him up. And when they were doing the debrief, and they said, well, you know, when you got disoriented, you got separated from the group, we gave you a, a, a beacon that would ping, and we could just hone in on you. We told you to go ahead and, and turn the beacon on if you were in any trouble. Why didn't you turn the beacon on? He said, I wasn't in any trouble. He said, I mean, I knew, I knew which direction land was. I mean, you know, I, I just was, I knew I'd get there eventually. You know, I'm not going to compromise the mission by setting that ping off, you know. I'm not, I'm not in any trouble. Do you have that kind of confidence in Jesus Christ? 
Where, you know, you might be going through some difficult things. You might, you might be feeling like, golly, I, I'm, how long am I going to have to paddle and kick here? You know, and I'm all alone. Are they coming? Do you have the confidence that God is with you? And it's going to be all right. You're not in any trouble. Because there is a bigger picture to what's going on. Here, here's the alternative. If we do not keep the faith, not only will we give an account to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the Soldier of Soldiers, embarrassingly, all of those martyrs who did keep the faith, who when their hands started failing because their time on this earth was drawing to a close and they threw the torch to us, they will, they will, we will see them again. As the poem says, if ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep though poppies grow in Flanders fields. What do you think the author of Hebrews was telling us when he said in Hebrews 12.1, Therefore, since we are surrounded, absolutely surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses that are the Christians who have gone before us, let us then lay aside every weight and the sin which would so easily ensnare us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. More, more appropriately, might I say, for Veterans Day, let us fight with endurance the battle that is before us. Because we serve a great king. We serve a great lord. And we serve the most incredible soldier that ever lived. The plan is bigger than you and me. But we are a small part of what he is doing in already now bringing his eternal and spiritual kingdom into this fallen world. As the worship team comes up to close out our service, as we sing together our our final praise to the Lord for this Sabbath morning. I invite you to respond as you're led. As we sing Jesus, only Jesus. I mean, He is your strength. He's the only one that can...